This is The Sim Pit. I'm your host, Sean Cole, but the real star of today's show is the R-Seat S1 racing chassis. Now, R-Seat chassis have been known for a long time as being some of the nicest purpose-built sim rigs that money can buy, and their previous models have include the extremely large and yet artistic N1 chassis, the compact and yet very solid RS1, and then the RS formula for that lay-down Formula One-style seating position. The S1 is an all new design that carries some of my favorite features from the N1 and some of the best features from the RS1 and they put it all together to recreate the S1 chassis. The S1 is an all new design from our seat that carries over some of my favorite features from the N1 and then some of my favorite features from the RS1 and put it all together in one package and they call it the S1. Now the RC S1 chassis is an all metal racing chassis that combines an elegant look with a highly functional design in a very rigid and comfortable package. The metal bars of the chassis are giant round steel tubes that resemble that of a race car roll bar. The plate or flat metal pieces are made of a heavy thick gauge and are extremely rigid. All of these parts are laser cut, powder coated and are of very high quality. The seat on the S1 chassis is the same as the N1 and the RS1, and it is a fireback seat in black that is built to look like a real racing seat with seat belt holes and a stretch over covering with ample padding. The seat has nice stitching and is very nicely tailored to the seat shape along with an embroidered R seat logo in the headrest area. The S1 chassis is highly adjustable and will work for drivers from four foot two all the way up to six foot six inches tall in a GT rally style driving position. It comes pre-drilled for and will work with most of the known sim racing hardware out there and everything from Logitech, Thrustmaster, and Fnatic. The S1 chassis is a modular design and despite coming with everything that you need, it also has a handful of accessories to complete your perfect rig. The rigs are made in the EU and come with a three-year warranty on all of their components, including the seat. The R-Seat S1 chassis, like many R-Seats, come in a variety of colors and different options when you're looking at their website. Starting off with the S1 chassis itself, that means no seat, no options, just the chassis in silver, white, black, or black and red, and that will set you back $799. The chassis, available in those colors, also comes with a seat. The seat will come in either white and black, red and black, or black on black along with the chassis for $9.49. And then finally, you can find it with the Alcantara seat covering in black on black on any of the colored chassis for $12.49. There are also a handful of options or add-ons that can be purchased to go with the S1 chassis. There's the keyboard and mouse tray for an additional $129 the speaker upgrade kit for $99, the S1 flight mount kit for $249, the shifter handbrake kit for $149, the butt kicker mounting kit for $99, and then finally, the tablet and button box mount for $119. Now we are testing the silver chassis with the black on black Alcantara seat, along with the keyboard tray, the shifter handbrake adapter, and the butt kicker adapter, for a grand total of $1,626 as tested. I also have the R-Seat RS Stand T3L intended for 32 inch monitors. It goes for an additional $439 and I am using it in the review. However, the review on that stand will come at a later date. Now, when you take the livery of the S1 chassis, the UPS guy, he's gonna have an exhausted look on his face because this entire chassis comes in just one box. The accessories come in additional boxes and they're a little easier to manage. But in the end, I found it was easier to unload that box from my porch, bring the parts into where I was gonna assemble the rig and then get to work on it. The assembly of the R-Seat S1 chassis will take you a little bit of while. It took me about an hour and a half and it is going to take a little bit of effort because it is bulky, it's heavy, and there are a few steps involved. The instructions are well laid out and easy to follow if you actually take the time to read them and line up all of the parts in advance. All of the hardware you need to put the chassis together are included, including the tools to do the job. Most of the parts have their hardware already installed, so there really is no confusion when putting it together. It comes down to putting the two side pieces together with the three cross braces to form the main base. 
then it's time to put the slider control arms on the rig. They do have a slight angle to them and they're directional, so it is important that they extend down the correct way. Despite having solid instructions, I found it nice to have the website open at times to double check the orientation of certain parts to prevent reinstalling them the correct way later. Next is installing the pedal deck to the main base on the lower front adjustable sliders. You then assemble the three-piece seat base and install it on the adjustable seat rails. The pedal mount then installs onto the pedal deck with two adjustable angle side plates and the main cross plate that is drilled for nearly every pedal set on the market. And before things get too heavy, I'm going to go ahead and add the four adjustable feet that go in the bottom. The wheel support arms mount to both sides of the rig with four bolts per side. I did have to lean on it a bit to get them in, but once in, this is a very substantial connection. And then finally, add the double slider adjustable wheel deck, also pre-drilled for about every wheel on the market. And then, install the seat. In a separate box was my keyboard tray, and this was very simple. One giant bolt goes on the bottom left side of the wheel support bars. It is heavy and hard to hold in place, but once this bolt is in, you are done with the arm. You are then just four bolts away from mounting the actual keyboard and mouse tray that is then adjustable in angle. The shifter handbrake mount has a few more pieces to it and it is just as beefy. There is first a triangle mount that can go on either the left or right side and the giant upright bar then bolts to that mount with four more bolts. The shifter brake deck mounts with four pieces. The top plate bolts to the slider plate and then it has a mount for left or right cross bracing it. Then you have a front and back slider bar that mounts to the deck slider and the mounting holes of the upright. This allows for a stable mount and a lot of adjustment. And then finally, you have a Thrustmaster Logitech adapter and a Fanatic adapter along with a variety of pre-drilled holes to work with. The butt kicker mount is super easy. It goes under the seat with four bolts and then will accept bolt down or clamp down butt kickers. Even with a few mistakes, it took me about an hour and a half to not only get the rig built, but also get all the accessories on and get it outfitted with my equipment. Now, when I stood back and I took my first look, I have to say, I was very, very impressed with the RC S1 chassis. Like I said, they took some of my favorite aspects of both the N1 and the RS1 chassis, they put them together. Some of my favorite features, like the ultra stiff, pedal deck. So my favorite features like the double support arm for the wheel deck. And then put them on the more compact and size RS1 chassis. But it was actually the moment that I installed all of my equipment that really brought the biggest smile to my face. This thing was ready to accommodate almost all of the commonly used gear out in the sim racing world. Everything from Thrustmaster, Logitech, and Fanatic. Everything from them. And they'd even gone a step further. They support Hussingfeld pedals and they support the Bodner wheel, which means they might even work with most OSW wheels without even having to drill the wheel deck. And then on top of that, it has so many adjustments available, the chances are you're going to be able to get it perfectly dialed in just for you. So now let's talk about me and my getting the installation of my components onto the rig just the way I want it. Starting off with the pedals. The main pedal deck almost looks like Swiss cheese with the amount of holes and slots drilled into it. In my case, I used high-end pedals in my testing and was able to mount my HPB pedals to the front Logitech slots without even busting out on a drill. And then my Rickmotech pedals mounted via four bolts through the Logitech slots again, no drilling. The wheel deck also has many holes ready to go and I was able to directly bolt my Bodner wheel down. Again, no drilling. The shifter handbrake deck was also built with common hardware in mind. There is a Thrustmaster Logitech adapter, as well as a separate adapter for the Fanatic shifter. It will also work with the new Thrustmaster Sparco sequential shifter handbrake, which I am using for testing in this review, along with an SHH shifter, which works in the Logitech mounting holes, again, without drilling. Nice. 
Now, once you get all your equipment mounted onto the rig, it still comes down to getting it dialed in or getting all those components exactly where they belong. And one of my favorite aspects of the RC S1 chassis are the amount of adjustments that can be made. And let me just remind you, they state that this rig will accommodate a driver anywhere from four foot two all the way up to over six foot six inches tall. Starting at the seat, you've got four different mounting positions to mount the entire seat assembly on the chassis. This gives you four and three quarter inches or 120 millimeters front to back. In addition to that, the seat is on its own sliders that can move forward or backward six inches or 152 millimeters of front to back adjustment. You can also adjust the recline of the R seat with four spots in the front and three positions in the back. Stepping over to the base, the main base, the whole tray, the bottom on the rails that are adjustable can be mounted in three different positions, giving you 4.75 inches or 120 millimeters of hard adjustment. Then the actual side pedal mounts can be mounted into three different positions, giving you additional 3.25 inches or 83 millimeters of hard mount options. And then to finish it off, the whole pedal base slides forward and backwards another six inches or 152 millimeters for smaller adjustments. To finish off the pedal adjustments, there are five different positions of angle that you can adjust the pedal deck from flat to about 30 degrees of incline. The wheel deck adjustments begin with the placement of the support mount. There are two different positions to mount it with two and a half inches or 64 millimeters of difference in position. Then the wheel deck itself uses that dual slider mechanism to adjust the deck in height, distance, and angle. It's hard to measure, but you have about six inches or 152 millimeters of up and down adjustment along with about two inches or 51 millimeters of front to back adjustment with a fair amount of angle adjustment as well. Now that finishes off the main rig, but that doesn't include the accessories. And of the accessories, it's the shifter handbrake mount that actually also has some adjustment critical to driving. The bottom triangle that mounts to the base can be moved forward and backward between two different spots, allowing for four inches or 102 millimeters of front to back adjustment. The top slider can be mounted in different positions, giving you a three and a half inch or 89 millimeters of up and down adjustment. With the slider rails, you can also adjust the entire deck forward and back about two inches or 51 millimeters. Then you can adjust the angle of the deck by adjusting the slider spots along with the mounting spots. And then the shifter mount adapter can be put anywhere from the front to the back of the shifter deck. And despite the keyboard tray having some angle adjustments, I actually like my keyboard and mouse to stay put, so I have mine pretty flattened out, but you can actually adjust the angle of the keyboard mouse tray as well. Now, after I assembled it, I already had a pretty good impression of the rig just based on the way it looked. By the time I mounted my equipment, got it all dialed in, I had achieved that perfect GT rally car driving position with no compromise whatsoever, and I got even more excited about the rig. And just from the sheer heftiness and the overall design, I was pretty confident in its ability or what it would do on track. But it really does come down to how does it do on track? How does it do under the heavy load of a direct drive wheel and heavy hydraulic or load cell pedals, how does this rig really perform while driving? When talking about the rig under racing or driving conditions, I start with the main chassis first and then break down the upgrades that I am using. The chassis, as I stated, allowed me to get the wheel deck height, angle, and distance exactly where I want them to be. With the dual bar support beam being so strong and firmly mounted, there is nearly zero movement whatsoever. Now on very close inspection, there is a touch of movement as the entire rig reacts to the power of a very, very strong Leo Bodner wheel. While driving, I would swear that it was movement free. It is only when I look at the close up video that there is any hint of movement going on. Now part of that lack of movement is due to the overall strength of the rig. But the other reason there's so little movement in the rig's wheel deck while driving is that ability to get the perfect distance and angle. There's no extra forces being given from me as I resist the wheel turning. It's exactly where I want and that reduces the amount of friction or movement on any rig, especially one as strong as this one. And I can say the same thing for the pedal deck. While driving, 
I do not sense any movement whatsoever from the rig. I've used two different heavy duty pedal sets and under heavy braking, the rig provided the perfect distance, the perfect angle, and enough strength to provide consistent feel on the pedals. In my previous reviews of our seats, both the N1 and the RS1 chassis, one of my small complaints was that the seat was a little too upright or a little too vertical. In the case of the S1, I don't know, maybe they listen to me, but they have a little more adjustment in the seat now, and you can actually recline it a little bit more than you could before, and it's just enough to get it in that perfect zone for me. This means that I drive this rig for hours upon hours at a time in total comfort. I drive for hours and walk away without any numbness in the bottom or strains from a compromised position. The padding is nice, the seat is supportive, and the geometry of the whole package is ideal. Since they are sold separately, I chose to actually single out all of the accessories and talk about them individually because everything else was the main rig. Now, I don't actually use a keyboard mouse tray while driving, it's just over there in case I need it. But when I do get into the garages or I'm doing other tasks, it's nice having a keyboard and mouse on the rig, but in a way that allows me to not only put it far away, but also allows me to bring it in over my lap when needed. Very comfortable, very easy to use. And the keyboard and mouse tray, when laid flat, are stable enough that I never had the keyboard or mouse fall off while driving. The mouse pad area is a little small and requires lifting the mouse to recenter it at times. But overall, it's well done for a sim racer's rig. The butt kicker mount is also nearly perfect. Unlike previous designs, this one mounts directly to the seat base instead of sandwiched between the seat and the base, which is easier to install. Now while racing, I don't really interact with the keyboard mouse tray very much, and the butt kicker mount, it just does its thing, I don't have to think about it, but we sure do interact or use our shifter handbrake mount, and it's critical to how it operates. Now most rig reviews that I've done over the past it's almost like the shifter handbrake mount is a second or afterthought. Like, oh, we forgot the shifter, let's just bolt it on anywhere. In the case of the S1 chassis, this is the beefiest or the heavy dutiest shifter handbrake mount that I've ever tested. It might even be the strongest part of the entire rig. It has no movement, no wiggle, and it has a decent amount of adjustability. With both a shifter and handbrake, it stayed completely stable, even on hard shifts or heavy grabs the brake lever. This shifter mount was no second thought, as it feels like a primary part of the chassis. Well done, RC. So at this point, you've heard all about the RC S1 chassis. I mean, we've talked about pricing, options, we've covered the assembly, we've covered installation of our components, getting it dialed in, and most importantly, we've talked about how it handled out on track. And I'm sure at this point, you've got your own opinion of this rig or chassis. And of course I do, but just to be perfectly clear, so there's no misunderstandings whatsoever, let's go ahead and break it all down with the good, the not so good, and the bottom line, starting off with the good, and that it is, it is an absolutely gorgeous sim rig. Extremely solid or rigid. Wheel deck, pedal deck, shifter deck. Highly adjustable at every component. Wheel, pedals, shifter, seat. Available in multiple colors, not just black. Reversible shifter mount, left or right side of the chassis. Comfortable seat. Good paint quality. More than enough hardware, including extra. Pre-drilled, compatible, Logitech, Fanatic, Thrustmaster, Bodner, Husingveld. Works with heavy duty wheels. Easy entry, lots of clearance. Fits a wide range of height drivers. Heavy enough to stay still, light enough to move. High quality hardware, good footprint, modular design, upgrade it later, and made in the EU. And now on to the cons, and I really don't have much to hit this with, but I'll start off with the price. It is an expensive sim rig. Narrow seat, sliders hard to move at first. 
And now on to the bottom line. Let's start off with my not so good list. I just really had so very little to hit this with. I try so hard. I looked at it every day and night going, I have to say something bad. Okay, it's expensive. I mean, at test as tested over $1,600. But everything was exactly where I needed it to be. It was so strong. It's a good looking rig. The narrow seat is probably the biggest thing that I would just advise people. Think about it. I mean, you have a couple inches on each side, uh, but you could equip it with your own seat. So maybe you just order it without the seat option. It's still an outstanding sim rig. But when I look at a sim rig for review, my primary concerns are seating position, stability, and adaptability. My secondary thoughts are the styling and its cost. When I think of the driving position, as I stated, I sit in the S1 in the same position that I would if I had made this rig. If this was a DIY rig, these are exactly the dimensions that I would have put myself into in a GT style position. It nailed it perfectly. It is surprisingly good in this area, being that it is made of welded tubing and not a profile type rig. And it is also the most adjustable rig that has accommodated more components than any rig that I have ever tested. The RC S1 chassis achieved all three of my primary concerns, driving position, stability, and adaptability. It almost took care of my secondary concerns of styling and cost. I mean, this thing is beautiful. It's gorgeous. This belongs in anyone's sim room or any man cave, and it's definitely gonna impress your friends. They're gonna wanna know what it's all about, but it does come at a cost. Now, when I think of the perfect sim rig, it's the rig I don't have to think about. When driving, I don't wanna think about my rig. Everything should operate perfect. It should never be one of my thoughts or concerns. It's only when my components move or when the seat is in an uncomfortable position that those things do occur to me. And that never happened when driving in the R seat S1. It was the rig that I never thought about once it was dialed in. And to dial it in for the first time ever in the history of this show, I didn't even need a drill. It was pre-drilled for all the components that I was gonna be using on it, and that really impresses me quite a bit. One other thing I'll say about the S1 chassis that I did love, and it has nothing to do with driving, but it's those other moments that we use our computers for. I was able to slide the seat back, slide that keyboard and mouse right over my lap, and comfortably browse the desktop, or even play shooter games and do other things. So everything that I've told you about this rig adds up to one simple thing. The R-Seat S1 chassis is my favorite rig that I have ever tested on this show ever, hands down. So that tells you just about everything you need to know about the S1 chassis. If you want to know more about it, you can check it out at www.rseat.net. And if you have any questions of me about this chassis, of course, email me at sean at thesimpit.com and I'll be sure to answer your questions. So that's gonna do it for this review. I'm gonna have a lot more reviews coming to you very soon at The Sim Pit. And of course, be sure to subscribe so you can know about them in advance. This is The Sim Pit. I'm Sean Cole, and I'll see you on the track.